To my regret, we now leave the 19th century. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, at my age, the 20th century is current events, okay? <laughs> Our next speaker is Heather Jordan, speaking on The Man in the Hat, the story of Leo Mole. Heather is an archivist for the Pikes Peak Library District Special Collections. She holds a master's in information science from the University of Michigan with a focus in archives and library science. Prior to moving to Colorado Springs, Heather worked on the Robert Altman Archive at the University of Michigan Special Collections Library. She received her archival certification through the Academy of Certified Archivists in 2013, which is a big deal. Congratulations. Uh, today I'm going to be telling you a story about a man named Leo Moll. Um, he was one of the first European World War II refugees to settle in Colorado Springs. I'm going to talk about the main events in his life that led him here, as well as what he did once he got to Colorado. Um, and I was able to piece his story together by using archival material uh, in the special collections department here at PPLD. So the main collection I used to piece his story together um, would be the Mole family papers. Uh, these were donated by Leo's children, uh, Gerda, Richard, and Bob. Um, the material ranges from 1905 to 1907. It's 7.6 cubic feet, or 18 of the archival boxes you see pictured here. Um, it's a wide range of material. It includes digital photographs, um, essays written by Leo, newspaper clippings, a whole lot of things. Um, so with that wide range of material and the large date span, I was really able to gather a lot of information about Leo, and his children also provided me with a lot of information um, and answered any questions that I had. So I thought it might be a good story to share today. Leo was born in Vienna, Austria, on October 28, 1909. His parents were Adolf and Frida. He also had a younger brother, Kurt. Uh, you can see he's a lot younger. Um, there's not a ton of information about Leo when he was a child, aside from photographs and some report cards. Uh, for the most part, his story um, in the collection starts when he's a young man working as a bookseller in Austria. So Leo recalls his days as a young man um, in speeches he gave while he was in the US Army. Um, he would give talks about his resistance activities, which were sometimes referred to as the underground, and that's what he uh, labeled his speeches. Uh, according to the Army's newsletter, uh, they're pretty popular. They're always at full capacity. Um, he defines the underground as individuals or groups opposed to tyranny that hope to overthrow the Nazi system. Um, he and the other members would meet in places such as swimming pools, theaters. They'd meet in, uh, near swamps and fields um, and tried to be as discreet as possible. Um, Leo uh, specifically um, did things such as distribute anti-Nazi literature at the bookstore where he worked. Um, at one point he helped with placing a fake bomb on a church steeple's bell rope um, to prevent a swastika flag um, replacing a flag that was up of the Austrian flag. Um, he was also an excellent orator. He'd speak at large trade union rallies about workers' rights. Um, he also organized a lot of these rallies. Uh, one was in Linz where he spoke from the city hall balcony pictured here. Um, so these activities and a lot of other activities uh, drew a lot of attention to him and marked him as a political troublemaker. So in May of 1938, Leo was working at his bookstore when a member of the Gestapo came in and arrested him. He was taken first to a police station and then moved to a collection station. Um, and at that station, there were a lot of men. Um, they held professional jobs, uh, lawyers, doctors, booksellers. Um, some were Jewish, some were not. Um, and from the collection station, they were then moved to a railway station. Um, in one of Leo's essays, he writes that once he was there, that's when he realized he was being sent to a concentration camp. Um, and that was also when he was placed into the hands of the SS. And he writes that that is when the torture and the cruelty started. He and the men were packed into a boxcar. They rode for 10 hours. And on May 31st of 1938, he exited the boxcar and found himself at Dachau. Um, this was the first camp established by the Nazi government. It was originally intended for political prisoners, and that's what Leo was considered. Um, the camp used the prisoners um, 
for labor, and it also served as a training center for the SS. Leo spent his days here doing road work. He would break and carry stones. Um, he writes that one day we would carry the stones in one direction, and the next carry them back to the same position. He received one meal at 5 p.m. It typically was a half pint of vegetable soup and a small piece of bread, and after his meal, he would have to go back to work. On September 22, 1938, Leo was transferred to the Buchenwald concentration camp, one of the largest in Germany. Um, in, at Dachau, he did uh, witness a lot of cruelty. It was no different at Buchenwald. He writes about being deprived of food. Um, he was lined up with the other prisoners. Every tenth person was killed. Um, it, he wrote several times about spending his Christmas day watching a man be tortured for hours before being executed. Um, you can see on the slide here a copy of his registration. Leo had the original with him. He kept it framed in his home. So Leo didn't talk about his experiences much until later in life. He did um, at one point talk um, at his grandchild's school. He also conducted a few oral history interviews. Um, while he was at Buchenwald, he was moved from road work to working in a uniform store for the guards. And this is just a really short clip of him talking about that experience. I got in the closing department for the SI and the SS. And I had the idiotic idea. How would it be? If I take one of those things, go through the door, article, and march out. <laughs> you mean one of those, the uniforms? Pick up one yeah, of the uniforms. Yeah. <laughs> Our friends of eight years said, "You are ill cynic." <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. <coughs> I can't do it. The last word was, if you ever come in again, you'll never get out. So after about nine months spent in two camps, Leo was finally released. Um, the exact reasons are sort of unknown. It's rumored that he was released with about 12 others in exchange for some high-ranking Nazis that were being held in England. This is Hertha, Leo's wife. Uh, she was also born in Vienna. She was born August 15th, 1912. Her parents were Gustav and Augusta Pistol. Uh, she had two brothers, Robert's, Robert and Fritz. Um, Leo, or Hertha was also sympathetic to resistance activities happening. Um, she would slip anti-Nazi literature under the doors of friends and family members. Um, one day when she was coming home from swimming, she had a bag with her with the leaflets in it um, and her wet swimming towel on top. Um, she was stopped by a Nazi policeman who searched her bag, um, somehow completely missed the literature, um, just feeling the towel, but she thought that it was such a close call she better um, leave Austria for her own safety. Um, so she smuggled herself into England by pretending to be a nanny that was hired to work in London. Once um, she was there, she continued with her resistance activities. She also joined the British Air Raid Precaution Service, and she served as a warden. Um, and this was created to assist citizens during the air raids. So after Leo was released from Buchenwald, he went to England um, and sought out other Austrians, and that's how he was introduced to Hertha. Um, they fell in love pretty quickly. After a few months of meeting, they moved to uh, Scotland together, and Leo joined the local trade union there. Um, and Leo and Hertha married in December of 1939. So in May of 1940, after being married a little less than five months, Leo was uh, taken. He was sent to the Heighton internment camp in England. Um, in a letter written by Hertha to Leo's brother, Kurt, she says, this supposedly happened to all of the male refugees here, as far as I can tell. I don't know if it was only Austrians and Germans or maybe Czechs as well. Um, this is a small town. It borders Liverpool. Uh, during World War II, it served as three camps. It was an internment camp prisoner of war camp and a base for American servicemen. Um, some of the internees were Nazi supporters. A lot of them were 
refugees from the Nazis, such as Leo. Um, and during this time, Leo and Hertha did correspond a little bit. Um, he wrote to her about feeling depressed. He lost quite a lot of weight. Um, and they also wrote to each other about immigrating to the United States. Um, Leo was here for about five months or so, and once he was released, they did uh, embark on their journey to America. So Leo received his visa on September 4th, 1940. Hertha received hers on September 6th. Um, in order to get a visa, you needed, among a lot of other things, a sponsor. Um, they didn't know anyone in the United States, so Hertha found a New York City phone book. She wrote a letter to people with the last name Mole. Um, pretty smart. Uh, <laughs> she received one reply. It was from a man named Harry. Uh, he was reluctant to help them. He didn't want to get in trouble, but he did feel sympathetic. Um, so he agreed to sponsor them, and he pretended to be Leo's cousin. Um, so on October 19th, 1940, they boarded the SS Cameronia and headed to New York. Um, the story goes that while on the ship, they were shown a postcard of the Antlers Hotel, and the mountains in the background reminded them of Austria, and they decided they'd like to come to Colorado. They arrived in New York on Leo's 31st birthday. So before coming to Colorado, they stayed in New York for a little over a year. Um, Leo worked as a baker. Um, he set up a course through the National Refugee Service. He's in the back row on the picture. Um, they also tried to get their family members to the US during this time. Um, they put down $800 with the Jewish Transmigration Bureau. Um, and this was a nonprofit agency set up to help Jewish citizens come to America. Um, the money would go to travel costs once the person um, could find a steamship reservation and acquire their visa. Um, Leo corresponded with a lot of people during this time, including a man named George Horn. He was an editor for the New York Times. Um, George wrote back to Leo saying, um, that the chances for his parents of getting steamship tickets uh, was disappointing. Hertha's brother Fritz also wrote to them saying, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the chances of getting ship tickets decreases as the war goes on. Um, unfortunately, they were both correct. Um, their parents uh, never made it here, um, and their $800 was later refunded. So after a little over a year in New York, Leo and Hertha came to Colorado. They did so by hitchhiking across the country. Uh, they planned to stay in hotels along the way, but were often invited by locals to stay with them, and they'd hold gatherings, and uh, Leo and Hertha would talk about the conditions of Europe. Um, as some of the first war refugees to come to the area, people were really interested in them. The Gazette ran a lot of articles about them. This is the first one, um, and in it, Leo tells the Gazette, we both love the town and its vicinity, its people and its spirit, and after hard years of struggle, we sincerely hope to have found our future home. And in the city directory, uh, the year after they moved here, um, it shows them living at 604 East Boulder, and that's a photo of their home. In 1942, Leo and Hertha opened <laughs> two bookstores, or excuse me, two, two stores. One was the book home and the other is Master Weavers of America. Um, Hertha learned the art of reweaving when she was 14. Her parents owned a dry cleaning store um, in Austria. She would repair tears in clothing, rugs, upholstery. Um, she would repair soldiers' pants, things like that. Um, they moved to a few different locations, but they eventually settled at 119 East Dale Street, where this uh, store still resides. Uh, Leo enlisted in the Army on May 10, 1943. His records show that at the time he was not yet a citizen, and he served as a private. He was stationed at Camp Crowder in Missouri. Um, he was training to be a switchboard operator, and he sustained an injury to his arm. So he spent a lot of time in Army uh, hospitals recovering from that. Um, after about a year or so, he did apply to be transferred to Camp Carson, um, now Fort Carson. Um, he was hoping to become an interpreter at their prisoner of war camp. Um, as far as I can tell, the request was not um, accepted though. Um, he was released from the Army November 29th, 1944. So for Leo, opening a bookstore was an appropriate step. Uh, when he was 15 years old, he became an apprentice for a book and antique dealer and worked 
in bookstores on and off since then. Um, while e uh, Leo was in the Army, Hertha ran the store um, and corresponded with him about the business. Um, she noted people were really interested in German books, not surprising at the time. Um, she also mentioned that a few people told her she was glad, uh, they were glad Leo was in the Army because they were worried that uh, she and Leo were German spies. So along with selling books, Leo created one of his own. It's called The Pictorial Guide of Colorado and the Rocky Mountains. Um, Leo found that a lot of the Camp Carson prisoners of war were looking for books about the area to take home with them when they were released. And so he saw the opportunity and created this book. Um, 2,000 copies were created specifically for the prisoners of war um, and written in German. The remaining were printed in English. Um, these are just a few pictures of that. Um, there's a picture of the prisoners on the bottom there. So this is a picture of Leo's inventory. Uh, he had quite a lot of books, um, over 40 to, or 45,000 I believe. Um, Leo would sell his books via mail order. He'd also sell them to Colorado College students um, and to the military. He proved pretty useful during the Cold War. Um, for some reason, he was one of the only booksellers in the West with a license to deal in Russian and Soviet publications. Um, why that is, I'm not sure. Um, but in an interview with the Denver Post, uh, retired General George Fagan said that all of the military installations in the area used to funnel their orders through Leo because the academy and other military institutions could not be named as the purchaser. So this is Mole Hill. Uh, Leo and Hertha bought this land before the birth of their first child. Um, it's a 295 acre property north of Colorado Springs. Um, it's accessible from the highway and county road. Uh, Monument Creek and Monument Branch Creek both crossed the length of the property. And uh, they ran a dairy farm from this. They also operated a large portion of both stores from this land. Um, in June of 1954, it was announced that the Air Force Academy um, would be built in Colorado Springs, and all of the land was going to be needed. Um, so it was purchased from them. I'm not sure what they got per acre, um, but I do know they were concerned about leaving. Uh, they had to sell off the dairy farm and find a place for all those books. Um, so once they did leave, they ended up uh, getting land on what's now the Rock Rim Inn, Tiffany Square, Public Rock area, and they raised 75 head of Black Angus there. Um, but they did really like living at Mole Hill. So as I mentioned earlier, Leo had three children. Um, Richard, who currently runs the book home and Master Weavers. Um, Bob, who resides in Paris, and Gerda, who resides in Denver. Um, in the 60s, Leo and Hertha co-founded the Austrian American Enzian Club for fellow Austrians in the area. And in the 70s, Leo created the Mole Prize in Economics for Colorado College. Uh, he did not attend college himself, but he did value education. Um, they also traveled quite a bit, um, visiting 50 countries. Um, they did end up, or Leo did at least, end up going back to Austria later in life. Uh, Hertha Mole died on June 15th of 1997. Um, when she died, a program was created by her children. In it, uh, their son Bob recalls the relationship between Hertha and Leo. Um, he writes that they were intelligent, independent, hardworking, and unconventional, and that their differences tied them together. Leo died on November 22nd of 2003. Um, in that, a program was also created, and in that program, um, in the end, was a poem called The Man in the Hat, written by Jennifer Mull, Richard's wife. Um, Leo was often seen wearing a hat and suspenders, so that's why she titled it that. Um, I'll just read a very quick part of that. The man, always purposeful, yet diverse in his interests and knowledge, the hat rested upon that man who touched many lives, accomplished untold successes, and lived an estimable life. We will remember the man in the hat, Leo Mole. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of the type of material you can find in an archival family paper. Um, and also, hopefully, it was an interesting story for you. Um, if anyone's interested in viewing the Mole family papers, they are accessible for anyone that comes in. Um, and I invite you to come down to Special Collections. Thank you for your time.
Our final speaker for this uh, portion of the day is Greg Atkins. Greg earned his bachelor degree in history from Oklahoma Panhandle State University, which is close to the Santa Fe Trail, but not quite there, okay? <laughs> In 2003, and his master's degree in history from Oklahoma State University in 2005. From 2008 to 2012, he lived in Colorado Springs and worked as a high school history teacher and as an adjunct history instructor. Currently, he is a third year PhD student at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. His research focuses on how Colorado Springs carved out its national reputation over the last 150 years. Greg. Thank you, Mike. My name is Greg Atkins. This is the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce in the modern Garrison City, 1940 to 1950, or for my journalism. Um, the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce officially welcomed Camp Carson to town on Tuesday, June 9, 1942, almost exactly 73 years ago. The boosters of Colorado Springs bragged, and still brag, about days like Tuesday, June 9th, 1942, unlike the couple of days we've had here lately. The sky was clear, the sun was shining, uh, the 6,075 foot elevation in the town kept the June heat at an average of 77 degrees. On June 9th, 1942, recent rains had sweetened the air, yet the arid conditions kept humidity low. Here's a picture uh, looking down Platt on a very similar day two years before. A similar day in 1893 inspired Catherine Lee Bates to immortalize the city's spacious skies, purple mountains, and fruited plains in America the Beautiful. H. Chase Stone, vice president of the First National Bank and newly elected president of the Chamber of Commerce, spoke of days just like this when encouraging the industries to locate to the city. This is just a year before um, the welcome to, of Camp Carson. On June 9, 1942, his encouragements had paid off. That morning, Chase Stone walked from First National Bank along Pikes Peak Avenue to the Antlers, which you can see here. So he's walking right down that towards the Antlers. Headed west along the street, as you can see, the peak perfectly framed the building, a legacy from the boosters who preceded Stone. Palmer, actually. Stone and his generation of boosters chose the Antlers to welcome Camp Carson to Colorado Springs. It was their first effort to transform the city into a modern garrison. Perhaps the view and warm sunshine on the walk caused Stone to consider the many times he referenced Colorado Springs' qualities to convince politicians and military officials to locate a base in Colorado Springs. Maybe it even gave him a moment to reflect about how his life prepared him to transform the city from a seasonal health resort and tourist spot to one of the military capitals of the United States. Since Colorado Springs' founding in 1871, boosters built the city's reputation using little else than their portrayals of its climate and its scenery. Here's an ad from the 1880s. I'll be talking about another ad. One booster in 1874 prophesied that the famed climate, beautiful scenery, and healing waters would bring thousands to the city, especially wealthy capitalists searching for a respectable place in the West to build their homes. Automobile tourism started to boom in the 1920s. Boosters repackaged the climate and the landmarks. One pamphlet in 1926 claimed that visiting Colorado Springs opened tourists to the joys of the residents, sunlight, well-kept roads, recreation, and mountain drives ending in picnics. Um, and here's actually a, a picture from some booster literature about health. The tradition continued long after Chase Stone died in 1966. By the early 80s, boosters deemed Colorado Springs the new Silicon Valley, now arguing that low humidity and sunny climate furnished a great place to construct sensitive microprocessors, while the natural attractions provided outdoor recreation for the industry's skilled workers. Uh, and this is uh, from Denver Post, I think. In the long tradition of promoting Colorado Springs, no group was more successful than Stone and his fellow boosters. Through the 1940s, they sought to reinvigorate the city. And here they're pictured in the 1950s. Uh, they're all having dinner at what was now Fort Carson. But in the previous decade, during the Great Depression, that economic 
uh, problem had diminished the number of tourists and health seekers on which the city's economy relied. New Deal policies focused on industrial economies. These policies held little promise for the service sectors of tourism and medicine in Colorado Springs. The Second World War brought gasoline restrictions and medical advancements, which seemed to further disrupt these sectors. The, Colorado, the Chamber of Commerce in Colorado Springs chose to adopt a new vision for the city, which courted military spending while maintaining their local control over the image of the town. Over 700 business leaders, community members, and local veterans greeted Stone and others at the Antlers on that beautiful day of June 9th, 1942. It was the largest Chamber of Commerce meeting to date. The crowd spilled out of the dining room into the hallways and other rooms. They came to the hotel for lunch to welcome the Army and to listen to local leaders talk about the arrival of Camp Carson to the city. Admit speeches by the mayor, three military officers, and one of Colorado Springs' U.S. Senators, Stone spoke for the Chamber of Commerce. His speech emphasized that the town was not the guest of the Army camp. Rather, it was the host. As the host, he sought to co-opt the city's new guests into the vision of the boosters for the town. We will actually have at our command, Stone stated, some 30,000 live, energetic, enthusiastic lads who could become the greatest of goodwill for this community. Through the control Stone and fellow boosters had over the sense of place in the city, they believed they could exercise influence over federal largesse and military personnel. Furthermore, they believed the military would become another aspect of Colorado Springs and not Colorado Springs become defined by the military. And they were correct. Colorado Springs is an unusual modern garrison city. During and after the Second World War, military spending transformed the United States. But the transformation was very unequal. Cities, especially those cities in the West, with industrial infrastructure and strategic positioning, received contracts. Others fell into obscurity. So how did Colorado Springs, a town of 37,000 people, that was it in 1940, with neither infrastructure nor positioning, attract enough military spending to become a modern day garrison city of 640,000 in our metro area? Through its conservative boosters, answers sociologist Ann Markison in her chapter on Colorado Springs in her book. Recent studies of Dallas by Janelle Pate and Phoenix by Elizabeth Tandy Shermer agree that conservative boosters in the West had a knack for attracting military spending. But if these boosters just wanted federal money, why did they shun New Deal funding and embrace military spending? Stone's speech helps answer that question. Conservative boosters embrace military spending because they believe they could better maintain local control, which in turn would help them direct military spending. In this paper, I use place theory and biography to examine the influence of Colorado Springs' boosters over warfare spending. I looked at brochures, surveys, personal correspondence, newspapers, speeches, and reports from archives in Colorado Springs, many of them in the Penrose Library. Scholars use place theory to analyze how humans ascribe meaning to a space. The ways Colorado Spring, or the way boosters reimagine Colorado Springs, as I mentioned earlier, as a resort town, as a health mecca, as a military garrison, as a tech hub, that attest to the power of place and the power of those who control it. The biography of Chase Stone helps personify boosterism in my paper. Watch as the actions and quality of Stone, a health seeker and a soldier, help the boosters of Colorado Springs transition from a health resort to a garrison. Together, place theory and biography show that boosters kept their control over the vision of the city and helped shape military spending. The concerns and solutions of Chase Stone and other boosters show that they not only courted and won federal spending, but also used their control over the town's image to influence it. The local control of city boosters and, and Chamber of Commerce in Colorado Springs and throughout the West was at the heart of the irony of objecting to the welfare state by courting the warfare state. When one understands their concerns, the paradox of criticizing federal spending on unemployment and welfare benefits while relying on billions of dollars in federal military spending begins to make sense. While both were federal programs, boosters in the West felt that the welfare funding diminished their control while warfare funding increased it. The life of H. Chase Stone illustrates the transformation of Colorado Springs from a health resort to a garrison city. Stone himself was a soldier turned promoter of Colorado Springs. He was the son of a lucrative uh, hardware owner in New York. Stone served aboard the USS George Washington as a navigator during the First World War, but received a discharge on July 14, 1919 as the U.S. demobilized. 
And here's a picture of the USS George Washington. It's in New York, and actually, uh, this is five days after Stone was uh, discharged. And it, at this time right now, it has uh, President Wilson on board. In March 1920, a doctor diagnosed Stone with tuberculosis and attributed it to his military service. This began over 20 years of correspondence between the military and Stone as he fought for medical compensation and later base locations and a recommission during World War II. After his medical discharge in 1919, Stone studied at Cornell, but his health deteriorated before he could graduate. His search for health began his change from a soldier to a city promoter. His search led him to Colorado Springs, to Cragmore Sanatorium pictured here. If it looks familiar, it's the administration building at UCCS today. Uh, in the summer of 1924, Stone checked into Cragmore um, in Colorado Springs, a city whose first boosters in the 1870s included leading tuberculosis specialists who recommended Colorado's climate as a cure for the disease. Before the discovery of streptomycin in 1944, doctors often prescribed dry, sunny climates. Stone's medical stipend allowed him to remain under care for almost a decade. There he continued to haggle with bureaucrats over his benefits and like many wealthy patients before him, began to participate in the town's civic life. He started and sold an aviation business, he dabbled in investment banking, he led a Boy Scout troop, and he met his future wife. In 1936, the Great Depression caused Cragmore Sanatorium and Stone to reinvent themselves. The sanatorium became a nonprofit. Stone became assistant vice president of First National Bank. Stone quickly became a hot commodity. Shortly after moving from assistant vice president to vice president in 1940, the Chamber of Commerce asked Russell Law, who was a rival banker and Stone's friend, to create and staff a committee dedicated to bringing the military to Colorado Springs. Because of Stone's military experience, familiarity with its bureaucracy because of his medical benefits and civic activities, Law asked him to chair the committee. In January 1941, Law and Stone visited the Navy Department in Washington, D.C. Remember, Stone had been in the Navy. He was hoping that his connections might result in a Navy training school here in landlocked Colorado Springs. <laughs> it didn't pay off. Uh, but Stone and the business leaders of Colorado Springs persisted. With continued pay from First National Bank, and traveling expenses from the Chamber of Commerce, Stone moved into the Raleigh Hotel, pictured here, right off Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., from March 1941 through January 1942, where he continued to lobby the military for a base in Colorado Springs. That's the uh, hotel in the 1950s, uh, but these two pictures here on the right are from 1935. In the spring of 1942, Stone secured a promise from the Army to locate a base in Colorado Springs, provided the city guarantee certain costs and conditions. The arrival of the camp rewarded Stone's bank with multi-million dollar deposits for the camp's payrolls and the chamber's businesses with defense contracts. Most citizens of Colorado Springs were overjoyed. Not content with just the base, though, Stone and other boosters sought to become a garrison city. Despite the promise of Camp Carson, Stone continued to lobby. In the summer of 1941, Stone followed up on an interest the Army Air Corps expressed about turning Colorado Springs Airport into an airbase. When the Air Corps learned that the Army had already selected Colorado Springs, the Air Corps withdrew its consideration. It believed the city could not house personnel for an Army base and an air command. So it appeared that becoming a garrison city would be, be a gradual thing if it came at all. But, of course, this did not deter the Chamber of Commerce. Since a place is powerful and flexible, as the history of boosterism in Colorado Springs attests, like their predecessors and descendants, Stone and his generation of boosters responded by adapting former conceptions of Colorado Springs to their goals. Russell Law, that friend and rival banker of Stone's, was now president of the chamber. As president, Law argued with the Air Corps' decision. Resort towns like Colorado Springs, he responded, had far more housing than comparable cities. And what the Air Corps saw as a disadvantage, too many military installations in one place, law turned to an advantage. He pointed to opportunities for combined training. He concluded with the fact that the surveys for the Air Corps paralleled those of the Army, so why not give Colorado Springs a chance, he implored. Law's reasoning concerning similar needs for different branches proved prophetic. The Air Corps reconsidered and placed a base in Colorado Springs. 
In the end, the strategies that secured Camp Carson and Colorado Springs Army Air Base proved even more successful in the Cold War as these bases grew into Fort Carson and Fort Peterson. The same strategies helped bring Int Air Force Base, the Air Force Academy, and eventually NORAD to the city over the next 20 years. Boosters maintained control over the image of the town despite the heavy military presence. They recycled the surveys they, came, they completed for the military to plug Colorado Springs to civilians. The weather data in the Chamber's 1943 ad campaign mirrors charts from the Camp Carson survey. The commander of Peterson Army Airfield himself provided a quote to plug the climate. Oh. <laughs> yeah, this is a good piece of booster literature. <laughs> the vast hospital complex at Camp Carson perhaps best exemplifies how the control of boosters over conceptions of, the of Colorado Springs resulted in military spending. Just as Colorado Springs' reputation for healthy climate attracted stone 20 years before, by the 1940s it helped convince the Army to build an immense hospital at Camp Carson. Quick to capitalize on the melding of the old vision of health with the new vision of the military, the Chamber published a book in 1945 entitled Hospitalization at Camp Carson. Remember, this is the Chamber publishing it. The book summarized the initial report of surveyors, highlighted the now federal endorsement of Colorado Springs' reputation for health, and dedicated more than half the book to other amenities around Colorado Springs. The book paralleled the mixture of military service, health seeking, and boosterism in Chase Stone himself. Stone, however, was too busy to realize it. The Navy had just discharged him as a lieutenant colonel in the War Shipping Administration, and he was back at Hotel Raleigh lobbying for Colorado Springs. Boosters of Colorado Springs like Stone were incredibly successful, and federal military spending continues to assure the city's economic success. An article in the Washington Post ranked Colorado Springs as the city with the largest workforce on federal payroll per capita. The report showed that 18.8 percent of the workforce received federal paychecks. Tellingly, Washington, D.C. placed fourth with 14.3 percent. So in terms of per capita workforce payroll, Stone's legacy outstripped even the capital that he lobbied. Colorado Springs works hard to protect this vital economic sector. On February 3rd, 2015, over 70 years later after Stone's address on that beautiful morning of June 9th, 1942, boosters, leading politician, and hundreds of Coloradans packed Centennial Hall to plead with the Pentagon to maintain the 26,000 troops at Fort Carson. Tellingly, the base over the years has adopted a very booster-like sense of place with the motto, the best hometown in the Army. The Keep Carson Strong campaign proves that place and boosterism continue to assure federal largesse in Colorado Springs. H. Chase Stone undoubtedly would approve. Thanks so much. <laughs>